Hey, got a little reading to do up here real fast, so bear with me a little bit, please. Just want to point out to you that very shortly we're going to head over to the youth edition that Kyle just spoke about. And tonight, the middle school and high school will spend their first evening over there in study and fellowship. And who's not excited about that? Pretty awesome. We took our little blueprint of our three-car garage and we tripled the square footage over there for the students to have plenty of room to uh, bring their friends, have more space to spread out, and continue to grow in Christ. I'll remind you that a couple years ago, as we were praying for a solution to our outgrown youth garage, this is right before COVID hit, God introduced Pleasant Hill to a couple that gifted us with a newly constructed house. Remember that? We sold that house for a nice sum of money, obviously, and we pocketed all that away in our savings account. When the decision was made to go forward to build this addition, God's money was set in there. It was an awesome thing to happen. This facility has been built debt-free. What a blessing. <laughs> so then came the dreaming and the thinking and discussing what a facility should be like and what it should have. It was time to get started. There were Saturday work days where big groups of folks showed up to lend their time, both carpentry skills, cooking in the kitchen to feed the workers, baking cookies, baking cinnamon rolls, all kind of stuff. It was a lot of people pulled together. There were some skilled volunteers that came in and tackled certain trade projects. Uh, Jeff Karen took the lead on electrical work. His knowledge came in really good over there for sure. Lynn Wiedekamp can hang drywall faster than anybody in two counties. <laughs> and he can paint over his head for seven and a half hours in one day with a spray van. <laughs> Thankful for those men for sure. But through the entire process, there were five individuals that worked tireless hours to see this project from the first board to the final nail. Today, we wish to publicly thank the following fabulous five. Please come forward as I call your name. Architect and foreman, Mr. Lee Davis. No certain order, Mark Olroyd. Lester Crawford. Chuck Duff. Tom Walls. You guys are still walking pretty good, actually. <laughs> you know? Well, okay, we'll wait. <laughs> on May 6th, back on May 6th, the first wall went up. Well, you got that photograph? Hard to believe we came from there to where we are today. It was five days a week for most of these guys, plus some Saturdays they were here. They never stopped. While I mentioned earlier the materials were provided through God's gift, there were a couple of trade skills we had to hire out, HVAC, that type of thing. But in rough numbers, these five men that we've nicknamed the Fabulous Five spent roughly 3,000 hours of labor in 19 weeks. If you calculate what a carpenter, a plumber, other trades they filled in for, we can guesstimate that they saved us well over $70,000 in labor. I'm sorry to say the check is not in the mail. No, no. But that $70,000 gift that these men put forward enables us to continue to do ministry here at the Hill, invest in our youth, invest in our communities, and serve many ways around the world. We're very thankful. These men are the primary reason the Youth Garage stands ready to serve this church today. It is ready to prepare the next generation to learn the gospel and to build lifelong relationships with each other and with Christ. 
please join me one more time in showing your appreciation to them. Now, I'm going to get right to it, okay? This is Picnic Sunday. The, the smell of pulled pork is wafting through the, uh, the facilities, and so let's just get right into it, all right? Well, the Bible tells us repeatedly that you and I are made to be like Jesus. You and I were made to be like Jesus. Look real quick now. Uh, you're going to have to listen quick today, okay? Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. For those, you and me, right? For those who God foreknew. Now, foreknew or foreknowledge, all that means is God can see the end at the beginning. So he already sees the end. He's outside of time, if you would. And he before knew. He knew that you would accept this gift that he wants to offer in his Son, Jesus Christ. So for those, you and I, God foreknew... He also predestined. He predestined. That only means, it's not complicated at all, that just means that God has put together all that was needed for you then when you accept in this gift that everything would be in place so that uh, through the work of his, complete, his son's completed work, you might be able to obtain then that salvation so that you can be conformed to the image of his son. That's the end result that God's looking for. You and I would be conformed to the image of his son. Look at 1 John 3 in, chapter, uh, in verse 2, where it says this, Dear friends, now, everybody say now. Now we are children of God. That's our current condition, child of God. And what we will be, everybody say will be, has not yet been made known. We don't know everything about it. We know some, but not all of it. It's not even close to what it will be one day. But we know that, so we know this. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Everybody say, like him. Like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now, in the meantime, we've got to remember what Jesus has said about a follower of Christ. Mark 8, verse 34, records that Jesus said that whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Everybody say deny. deny. Deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What does that mean? Take up their cross and follow me. Well, I mean, some of you men out there might say, well, if you knew my boss, preacher, that's a cross I've got to bear. Some of you wives might say, if you only knew my, well... All right, you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, that may be part of it. It may be part of it. But what we do know is this. It, doesn't, it, it means more than just believing in Jesus. It means more than reading about Jesus, you know, worshiping Jesus, or feeling really good about Jesus. It means to follow Jesus and by being like Jesus. By being like Jesus. You are made to be like Jesus. Turn to the one of your neighbors and say, you are made to be like Jesus. Now turn to your second choice and apologize, or your second choice, and then say, you are made to be like Jesus too. Now that seems to be a difficult task that's before us, to be like Jesus. But the Apostle Paul is our example. You know, it's one thing, we look at Jesus and we say, we know he was 100% man, but it's like, hey, he's different, though. not quite, you know, okay, tempted out, okay, you know. But then Apostle Paul says, okay, I'm a sinner like you are. You do this. Look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So let's turn to Colossians 3. That's where we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to sit down for a few minutes in uh, that passage, Colossians 3. Now, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul here describes how to follow Jesus, how to be a disciple of Jesus, how to take up your cross like Jesus, how we can become like Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, though. I want to be clear. He's not saying you're going to be a little G God like Jesus, right? Not going to be a little G God. You know, during Sunday school one day, the class teacher said uh, he selected a, a couple of middle aged a middle aged couple, like in their early 40s, and um, 
and, and, and said, I want you to act out that scene, that famous scene of the burning bush in Moses. God speaking through the bush to Moses, and he said, the, the, the wife, he said, I want you to be Moses. You read Moses' lines, and you know, the husband, you read God's line. And so it was going along great until we got to verse 15. And at that one, the, the wife, as Moses, she mistook her husband's words, you know, that to read. That was God's part. And so the teacher interrupted and said, oh, wait a minute, you're not God. And he said, without missing a beat, I've been trying to tell her that for 18 years. <laughs> God doesn't want you to become a little G God. He wants you to become godly, developing Jesus' character, his, the, the way he thinks, the way he acts, the way he feels, uh, to become like Jesus. Look now at Colossians chapter 1. Let's see how we're going to go about that. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Everybody say raised. raised. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, since then you have been raised. When were you raised? Well, in your baptism. In your baptism. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Everybody say died. When did you die? In your baptism, right? And your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Then result again. Not yet. Then result with him when he returns. See, too many Christians are out of their minds. They have a mind problem. They have bad habits that they can't control. Actions originate in the mind. So there needs to be this changing of our mind. We are to rest in the accomplishments of Christ. He's the one that has ushered us into the kingdom. He, he did all the work necessary for us to get in you. So we rest in that. We rest in that salvation that God's provided in Jesus. It's kind of like this. There was a movie years ago I watched with my daughter Mallory entitled The Prince's Diaries. Well, maybe it was last week, but no. Back, back, when, back when she was a little girl. The plot goes like this. There's this awkward teenager. She's like just trying to get by, uh, hanging in the shadows, you know, of high school kind of thing. And there's this knock on the door, and this, uh, th this official-looking guy, he, he shows up, and he says, you don't know this, but your father, who you've never met, is actually a, a king in a country you've never even heard of, and that makes you royalty. And you are, you are a princess. And I'm here to tell you that we need to go back to that country and you need to begin your rule. Everything changes then for that girl that day. She needs to learn now how to look, how to act, how to walk, how to talk, all this different stuff she needs to learn uh, about her rights, her responsibilities, her privileges, and her new role uh, of royalty. And here's what the Apostle Paul is saying to us. Jesus Christ has come knocking, but it's the door of your heart, if you would. He's knocked, and since you've chosen to open the door to him, and to believe then in the good news that God is doing in Jesus, to turn then from living your old way and to begin following everything he says now, he calls you royalty. You are a child of the king. Now, come with me, if you would, Jesus is saying. I'll take you into the kingdom of God, and there you'll learn how to live in my father's kingdom. So Paul is saying first then to become like Christ, Shift your focus to a heavenly mindset, and that's going to help you as you're, you live your, you know, with your earthly living, help you in your obligations then as you follow Jesus. God gives us many metaphors about the Christian life. I mean, there's, just, there's dozens of them. A common metaphor is this picture of taking off clothes, old clothes, and putting on new clothes. This physical imagery gives us an idea of what's in a sense, happening uh, in, in inwardly, spiritually. Very famous passage, John chapter 11, Jesus performs a miracle, and in it, uh, he also illustrates this spiritual truth of taking off the old clothes and uh, putting on the new. It's a story of Lazarus, um, where, God, where Jesus raises him from the dead. Mary and Martha, sisters of Lazarus, they sent word to Jesus to come. The one you love is sick. Jesus delayed for several days, and Lazarus then dies. Disciples are baffled about this behavior, and they say, Math. And, and when, this, when the sisters greet him then, as he finally gets there, in a sense, they say, Master, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. 
When Jesus sees their sorrow, their grief, when he sees the grief of all those around, we're told that Jesus wept with them. And with his eyes full of tears, Jesus approached Lazarus' tomb and gave instructions for the stone to be removed. Martha objected. I love the King James Version of this. It says this in John 11, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Everybody say stinketh. Maybe that's not one I should have had to say. <laughs> For he's been dead four days. Been dead four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you, he said this a few months ago, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? So they roll the stone away. Jesus speaks in a voice loud enough to raise the dead. See what I did there? And, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And you know the story. But you know, if Jesus didn't specify Lazarus, you better believe it that all of the tombs would have been emptied that day. Verse 44 tells us the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and, and, and a cloth around his face. Now Jesus said earlier that this is going to be to the glory of his father. He also shows us in this that Jesus calls the shots of the living and the dead that also Jesus would soon, he would be the one that would be resurrected in much the same way. And that also he's shown us that all believers, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, will resurrect in a like manner as Lazarus one day. All that and much more. But there's also this picture that Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And at the sound of Jesus' voice, Lazarus comes stumbling, hopping out of the tomb. Now, in those days, corpses are wrapped in these long pieces of linen that have been soaked in spices. So Lazarus came out of the tomb, still wrapped up with those stinking grave clothes. He couldn't talk. He couldn't walk. He had received life, but he still had this problem, these stinking grave clothes. Lazarus had been given life when he was dead. That's a picture of your salvation and, and my salvation. But he's still bound by these stinking grave clothes. You and I can face the same problem. Jesus gives you life, but you still struggle with those stinking grave clothes of your old life. In some ways, we're like Lazarus. He was saved, but he still stunk. He was rescued, but he still reeked. He was energized, but he was still entrapped, and he had life, but he wasn't liberated. Hence the importance of getting rid of those old, stinking grave clothes. And so we come to our first point this morning. To be like Jesus, throw away your old, stinking grave clothes. To be like Jesus, throw away your old, stinking grave clothes. Now, you know, if Paul Goldschmidt or Nolan Arenado were to show up to help you improve your hitting for softball or for uh, ball at school or little league, you know, whatever. There's some things they would tell you you need to do, okay? But they'd also tell you some things you need to stop doing if you want to become like them. Kind of along the same lines here we see in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, put to death. Now, this is what we're to do now, okay? One day we're going to be conformed fully to the image of, uh, of Christ. But now, today, now, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to, everybody say used to, you used to walk in these things in the life you once lived. Now I want to point out a few things from this hefty lift, uh, list here. Now notice how he says that, you know, to deal with these things, how he says to do it. It's not casually. You don't just try to tame them. You don't try to learn to moderate them. Put these things to death, he says. It's as if there's some kind of wild beast that's in your soul roaming around. So don't try to tame it. Don't try to, uh, you know... Uh, Cage it, just kill it. Kill it. And the list isn't just some set of random sins, but there's a progression here starting with the end result, and that is this ongoing sexual immorality. It's kind of the end of a downward spiral. 
And that's sexual immorality. That's anything outside of God's context for his gift to us of sexual intimacy that should be only between a husband and his wife. It's a gift from God, therefore it's a very good gift. He created it. And when we step outside of his boundaries for sex, we violate it. The Bible tells us that that includes premarital sex, sex before you are married to the one you're going to marry. It includes adultery, which is a married person having sex outside of their marriage with another person, or a person that's not married having sex with someone that is married. There's also homosexuality, that's having sexual relations with those of the same sex. Any of those is sexual immorality, and Paul says we got to kill it. We need to kill it. Now, the word for sexual morality in the Greek is pornea, where we get the word pornography from. You know, when you read about the sexual indulgences of the Roman Empire, the early church's day, Paul's writing to those in that society, you can see similarities between them and our 21st century culture. God has created sex as a very good thing, and he has given each of us a sex drive. Sex is like a powerful river that must be kept within its banks, within its boundaries. And like a river flooding its banks, whenever sex gets outside of God's boundaries of marriage, there's always destruction. There's always misery. Then Paul moves then now to the word impurity or impure behavior. That's what's done right before. Remember, we're spiraling down, so sexual morality is at the bottom Right before that is this impurity or impure behavior. We, we begin to manipulate things. You know, we become maybe flirtatious. We lose track of our senses. We kind of, we do not no longer restrain ourselves, causing us to make these bad decisions that we, we, makes us jump then to the next stage, of, which is that sexual immorality. But even before these, this impure behavior, Paul says there's this lustful thinking that begins here in the mind. We think of different scenarios than within our marriage and with different people that we might want to be with. That puts us into then impure positions that would lead to uh, sexual morality then again. Before that comes greed. How does that tie in? Because we think of it, no, no, it, it's thinking what I have is not enough. I need more. And then we head on down the line then. And Paul says the root of all of that then is idolatry. Idolatry. That's the root. That's that's the start of it, is idolatry. That's when you take a look at what God has said, and we basically say, I I see what you have given me, Lord. Uh, What you call me to do to honor you, but I'm going to do what I want. And that's worshiping yourself. You've made yourself an idol before God. Remember, Jesus, in the prayer that he outlined for us, said, uh, Thy will be done on earth or in my life as it is in heaven, Lord. That's how Jesus wants us to pray and live. Jesus in the garden said, as he said, Lord, is there, God, Father, is there another way? And then he said, okay, thy will be done. Idolatry is the opposite of that. We can never become like Jesus then with that attitude. Now, you may be feeling pretty satisfied right now looking at that list. You're thinking, I I really don't have trouble with those sexual sins. Well, buckle your seatbelt because the next list then may be just for you. Look at verse 8. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. And Paul wouldn't be able to, to do it. I guess it could happen a little bit, but... Wouldn't you think that would include our fingertips, this filthy language from our lips and our fingertips with social media that we have today? Do not lie to each other since you have taken off, everybody say taken off, your old self with its practices and have put on then, everybody say put on, the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. That's our, uh, our goal. That's to be like Jesus. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now most of these sins have to do with what we say then, how we say something. 
And isn't it interesting how we will condemn someone from that first list, but we'll give a pass to those who might be included on that second list. Oh, that's just how he is, we say. Or, you know, that's, she's always been like that. She kind of has a mouth. This list starts kind of at the end as well, where you've got, the, as it spirals down, you've got anger and rage. Before that, so there's internal planning then of some malicious thoughts on how we might hurt that other person. Before that, it's this whole idea of slandering them. Uh, that's saying some negative things uh, before others, trying to get them to be with me on this, so I slander the person in front of others. Before that, we've got total disrespect now because we, we really don't care. We, well, we, we lie about them and to them. Uh, we're not sharing the truth about them, which takes us to the very root of all this, and that is prejudice. Paul's saying that anyone you see yourself as better than, that's where it starts. And we can never be like Jesus that way. When we, we see ourselves as better than others, regardless of skin color, nationality, rich, poor, boss, employee, doesn't matter. Jesus is talking about just us looking down on some other person for whatever reason. Jesus poured out his life for everyone and says, you need to love like I do. So the Apostle Paul says the root of, the, of most sin is in these two areas, the sexual sin or the sin of, of things we say and how we look at others. So Paul, <laughs> thanks, man. How, how do we deal with this? Well, typically what we do is we go just right out to the end and say, well, no sex outside of marriage, and then uh, we're not going to yell and fight with people. Uh, we say that over and over again, but what are we doing? We're pruning away the bad fruit, and doing nothing about the root that's making it spring up in our lives. The idolatry, the saying like, I'm going to do things my way, and the prejudice, I don't care about that other person. But to change, there must be this transforming of the mind. Hence, that's where Paul started in the chapter. This renewing of the mind, with our heart and our mind thinking on things above, looking at others and ourselves from God's viewpoint. That there needs to be a change in the way that we uh, see these things and live out these things. Let me give you an example. Let's say it's a really hot day. You come by the house, you get out of your car, you come over, you see, I got a little project going there in the yard. Uh, I'm working, uh, you know, and a little table there by me. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I'm doing some painting. And you see that I also have some little buckets there, some empty ice cream containers that just happen to be laying around. And um, I'm filling them with some peppers I picked out of the garden. Got a bunch of buckets there. And uh, you come in, I'm going to say, hey, yeah, so why don't, you, why don't you move some of those around, get your own little bucket and take it home. I'd, I'd love you to have that. And so then you, you, you do that, but then you, you're thinking it's catching your eye, and you're thinking, I'm going to go ahead, and this one looks unique, and take a little taste. And, man, it just lights you up. I mean, your eyes start to water, your nose starts to run. You've been there. And you start coughing, though. You're coughing uncontrollably. And you look over at that table, and you see that I've got a mason jar and this beautiful, clear, glistening liquid that really looks good. You reach out and say, like, don't do that. Those are mineral spirits. And, 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 and you know, uh, you, you don't want to do that. And all of a sudden now, you think, okay, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good. Once you realize how deadly it is, you change your mind. Until we see our idolatry, our disobedience, disobedience to the Lord, remember that Jesus said this, John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. So until we see our idolatry, our disobedience as poison to our souls, we're always going to struggle to be like Jesus. Until we see our prejudice, then the way we view others, Remember, in 1 John 4, we're told, and God has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also, must also love their brother and sister, and it's not talking about just your family. Until we see our prejudice and viewing ourselves as better than others, as poison to our soul, we're always going to struggle with those things. So this change is needed. It involves this conscious decision. Look again at verse 8. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things. And verse 10 then, and put on this new self. So rid, now put on. Put on the new self then. we got to make this decision to take off the old and put on the new. That is being uh, renewed in the image of its creator. 
So Paul now lists 10 Christ-like characteristics we're to put on to replace those old clothes. But these aren't just qualities that Paul just pulled down out or just was guided to by the Holy Spirit. These are qualities that form a full description of Jesus. So you put these on and you're going to dress like Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. To the church there, Paul says uh, another way, and he actually says, dress like Jesus in this one. Look at verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. That's the now. We're not to the not yet. We're to now. The hour has already come for you to wake up. Everybody say, wake up. Wake up. Maybe you can go like that if you need to to whoever's next to you. Wake up. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves. Everybody say, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So number two, then dress in style to be like Jesus. Dress in style to be like Jesus. How do we do that? Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. God's plan has always been to make you like Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 says it this way, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. Everybody say grow. We will grow to to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God wants us, each of us, to grow up like Christ in everything. You know, babies are cute, but if babies stay babies, I think we know some grown babies, don't we all? That's tragic. God wants us to mature and to develop because he has made you to become like Christ. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not just one day, all of a sudden, zap, and you're there. It's a process, and the process takes an entire lifetime. Ruth Bell Graham tells a story years ago when her and Billy were driving on a trip in North Carolina. Came to a construction area, and um, uh, it, it, it was, it was a 20-mile-long stretch. It took them over an hour to go through. As they finally began to... Uh, arrive at some of the parts that had already been constructed. We're just kind of waiting for some lines to be put down, whatever. But they're out of the constructed area. They're finally getting out. There was a sign there, and she yells out, that's what I want engraved on my tombstone. But he's caught off guard, and he said, what do you want on your tombstone, honey? And she said, that sign, construction complete. Thank you for your patience. (laughs) All of us are in process. The process is the Lord sharpening us, molding us into his image until the day we die. Paul said, Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Everybody say completion. Until the day of Christ Jesus. He's going to get it done. It's going to take the rest of your life, though, for God to build character, these character qualities of his son Jesus. And Jesus intended us to do this together. 
We all struggle with those old urges, those bad attitudes from our sinful nature, from the flesh. Remember our spirit, where by nature our spirit has been made right by God in Christ. So the spirit's right. The spirit's waiting to break loose from this sinful flesh, this, this body that's not been made complete yet in Christ. And so we have this sinful nature. We all need help. We can no more ourselves, like Lazarus, free ourselves from our old stinking grave clothes. Jesus could have exercised his divine power. And imagine that scene. He says, Lazarus, come forth. He could have said it, and in his divine power, Lazarus come out looking brand spanking new, clothes and all. But he said, no, no, no. I want all of you around him. I want you to go over. I want you to take off the grave clothes and let him go. And fortunately, there was a people there that cared enough, get their hands a little dirty. Remember, he what? He stinketh, Right? And, 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 and they helped in Lazarus remove those old grave clothes. And that's why church is so important. That's why getting smaller into a smaller groups, small groups, Sunday schools, youth groups, getting in these smaller groups, too, that's why they're so important so that we can obey the words of Jesus and help Lazarus, help our brother and sister remove those old gro- uh, grave clothes. If you're struggling, I encourage you, find someone to help you. Find that someone that would pray with you and and, and also maybe hold you accountable. But look at this truth from another perspective. Do you know a Christian who's struggling in their old stinking grave clothes? Don't just stand by and let them suffer. Worse, don't criticize them. Don't ostracize them. Jesus is telling him the same thing he told those guys standing next to Lazarus. Take off the grave clothes and let him, let her go. So what's your need today? Do you need to get rid of some old junk in your life? Can't do it on your own. You'll be much better getting, of course, Jesus to help you, but also reach out to his servants. Do you need to be putting on the new life of Christ? Study Jesus' life. Get, get out your New Testament. Go through the Gospels. Look at Jesus' character and then put on his character. And by all means, throw away all your stinking grave clothes and start dressing in style like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you, as Scripture says, that while we were sinners, that Christ died for us. You didn't wait for us to clean up our own act because we can't. And you know, we're so fortunate, so blessed that you reached out to us. Thank you for the faith that you've given each of us, Lord. We pray that you would help us with our unbelief. And we thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us. That you know we're sinners. And you've given us a Savior in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to think more highly of others than we do ourselves, that we would want to assist and help someone, that we wouldn't want to look down on them, that we truly would love you first, and by doing that, being obedient, but then love others then as ourselves. Forgive us of our sin against you, our sin against one another, Lord, that's ultimately against you then also. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you desire us even now to live a better life, not just the the day that's going to come for us, but that even now we can become more and more like your son Jesus. To that end, we pray for each of us. Amen. Now, I know you can smell... Uh, lunch, and we're looking forward to a meal, but we came here for another meal, correct? Mainly for this meal that we're about to partake of right now. Um, That being said, I've really been looking forward to hanging out with all of you uh, on the lawn this afternoon. Uh, There's a lot to be looking forward to, and it's, it's time with friends. And so I've been thinking with friends about friends this week, and you may have heard a, a variation of this statement before, but I, I believe that uh, to have a friend is one of the greatest gifts we can receive 
from God. Now, I also think that God's desire, His built-in uh, mechanism for us to receive and learn how to love is, is certainly family, and it's important. But there's always this uh, little caveat with family that we are, in, in some ways, obligated to love one another, correct? It's just kind of part of it. But if you've got a friend, you've got someone that has chosen to love you. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of that, uh, that is just something that, that is unparalleled in our experience of life. And uh, it's occurred to me that we've, we've sang several lines uh, this morning. Dave talked about it, um, but it's pretty amazing to know that Jesus has considered us his friend. Uh, John 15, verses 12 through 17 says this, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And then this verse that, that I've been thinking about this week, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. How good that we who have come uh, to partake of this meal, we can call Jesus friend. He chose us. The kind of love that he has for us draws us in. It gives us uh, the life that he, he wants to give us. And, and I'll add, uh, we, we need to, to remember that and be thankful for that, the kind of love that Jesus showed us on the cross um, but also think about uh, how are you being a friend to him? How are you loving others in a way uh, that, that Jesus loved you? And when we do that, we get to experience being a friend as well. So think about these things as we partake of this meal together. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you uh, for Jesus. Thank you that he... Uh, chose us in our brokenness, in our uh, just total necessity of Him. Lord, we need that love. We need uh, that forgiveness. And thank you that we get to remember that in this time. Lord, help us to be better friends. Help us to uh, love because you've loved us first. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.